welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research and advocacy group. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. Before I introduce this week's guest, I would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia. We respect the elders of the past and present, and we are grateful for the continuing care of the land, waterways and skies where we listen, learn and thrive. This week, I am pleased to welcome Dr Ron Levi to talk us through climate legislation and environmental constitutionalism. Ron is an Associate Professor at the Australian National University and an interdisciplinary researcher writing on public law and political theory, especially deliberative democratic theory. He's won several academic awards and has published an impressive number of works on law and political theory in books and journals in at least five countries. Welcome, Ron, and thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I do have a lot of questions for you, Ron, so I hope you'll excuse my ignorance and my enthusiasm as I pick your brains for the next 45 minutes. Can you give me just like a brief summary of deliberative democratic theory? It's a discipline of researching democracy where the central idea is that we're looking for better ways of doing democracy. And what that means exactly would be listening to each other, engaging with each other on a basis of equality. We are well informed when we make decisions. You know, all of that might seem a little bit unlikely given the way democracy has gone in the past let's say five or 10 years in most of the democracies around the world. But the first thing that deliberative democracy scholars do is they basically just set out a certain certain number of benchmarks. So what would a a fine democratic practice look like? How would a democratic practice be practiced if we could have the ideal democracy? And then after that, they look at concrete institutional ideas for how to make that a reality. Now, it's impossible to make that a complete reality, but you can have better and worse democracies. So, for example, you can have a referendum where there's no information given to the voter and uh, there's uh, misinformation and disinformation and so on. Now, what if we had laws and systems in place in order to better inform people and to have high profile deliberative councils among experts and citizens so that we can hash out the ideas before we then go off and vote. So that's one idea among many in deliberative democracy about how we can actually make uh, democracy at once democratic and deliberative in in the senses that I talked about. I mean, you're kind of aiming for the perfect democracy, understanding that that's not necessarily achievable, but, you know, as long as you're always improving that that's, that's the goal, right? That's exactly right. And, you know, it's partly achievable. We know that from a host of studies. So deliberative democracy is one of the biggest disciplines within political studies more generally. And we've got many publics and citizens assemblies and, uh, you know, all sorts of interventions into the democratic process that might make democracy better, more thoughtful, better informed and so on. So we have a lot of evidence to show that it's not easy to do, but it's possible, at least in part. Right. So education has got to be a really big part of that. Yeah. Is it difficult to get people to vote for policies, to vote for education if they don't have that education to begin with? That's a great question, actually. So it's a bit of a catch-22 that, um, you know, people like me are advocating more deliberative democracy and, and, uh, you know, a better informed process for constitutional change or for addressing environmental challenges and so on. But the problem is that if you don't already have a certain amount of knowledge about, let's say, the environment or other policy challenges, then you might not realize that this is an important thing in the first place. So there's a bit of a, a catch-22 that we we don't live in societies that are perfect deliberative democracies. And so how do you convince people to strive for deliberative democracy when they don't necessarily know what it is or why it's a it's a positive thing. Why it's a good thing. Yeah, I think it's one of those you don't know what you don't know yeah. situations. So it's a, a challenge, I think. Do you think that democracy, given the challenges that it has, is the best way to achieve meaningful climate action in the time that we have left? Yes, 
And uh, of course, we don't have a choice. But um, we, if we did have a choice between democracy and something else, I don't think we would choose the alternative because uh, looking at the non-democratic countries around the world, are they doing any better mm. in terms of uh, addressing climate change? Uh, absolutely not. I think that you know, if you look at uh, authoritarian dictatorships, um, they tend to be rather nationalistic. They t- what they tend to care about is the hoarding of power, particularly for, you know, the elites in that society, but also for the particular country. The nationalistic drive is to to be, be selfish. And that kind of selfishness is not particularly useful for the environment, which is a moving set of challenges where you have to have almost 200 countries cooperating. And And so a nationalistic authoritarian country is really not in a very good position to contribute to those efforts. And it's really democracies, for example, you know, uh, Australian democracy, uh, Canada, um, Europe, um, South American democracies and so on. Those are the ones that are really making some of the biggest strides, ones in in Asia as well, in Africa. So now the problem is that democracy is imperfect. And as I said before, we don't we don't live in societies that have perfect deliberative democracies. So on one hand, democracy might be better than the alternative, the authoritarian alternative. But on the other hand, we need to improve democracy so that we we fix some of its challenges. So, you know, we can't necessarily get our democracies on board with, you know, if this is the the climate change mitigation that we need, then this is where we are. If we were in an authoritarian society, we would be short of where we are now, but we still wouldn't be where we need to to be. And so... um, the challenge, I think, is to improve the way we make decision making within the context of democracy. Right. OK. I mean, that does make sense. I, I think my understanding of authoritarianism is that, you know, it's a power system where you, you've got like your people at the at top, but then it, like, you know, you've got your supporters that you need to keep in line as well. So it's there's no such thing as a benevolent dictator, I suppose. Is the idea that I come across sometimes is, you know, people go, well, a benevolent dictator who just wants the best for everybody would just make all the right decisions and it would just happen. That's absolutely right. There's no such thing. There has never been such a thing. And it's hard to imagine that it would ever come about. So it's, you know, it's kind of a useful thought experiment to think of what it be, what, what would it be like if we could snap our fingers and make um, uh, all the policy that we need for climate change mitigation. But we actually live in, you know, either a democratic or a non-democratic society that is imperfect. And that's that's what we have to work with. Yeah. Have you thought about like the concept of artificial intelligence and its uh, potential, I suppose, in refining laws? I like the question. Um, It's not necessarily my area of expertise, but I acknowledge that there are a lot of people working on artificial intelligence as ways of making decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then then, of course, we still have the problem that um, we somehow, we humans, we still have to somehow keep that artificial intelligence accountable. And, you know, the classic example would be drones fighting wars. But um, but then when it comes to things like climate change, for example, you know, if we if we just sort of fed the problem into a computer and said, look, come up, come up with a solution, that wouldn't be an adequate way of addressing it because their value balancing size is involved. Yeah, the, the, there's human values that, you know, a machine, it, it's going to be difficult to get that across to a machine in a way that it it understands it right exactly and so for example um who should uh, bear the brunt of climate change mitigation i mean while on one hand mitigating climate change is probably going to be a net positive by far in the short term there might be people who pay costs Mm -hmm. so how do we choose which people should bear the upfront costs the most well it could be an economic decision, it could be a technical decision, but it also has to be a value decision. Yeah. You know, who can afford it best? Which societies are most responsible for climate change historically and uh, ought to be paying more now? So these are the kinds of questions that uh, are philosophical questions, they're moral questions, they're value questions. And Well, I suppose it, it's a practical thing as well, because a lot of the resistance that I see from people to, you know, voting for climate legislation or action is concern about their industry and you know way of life Uh, absolutely and you know obviously you can't blame people for uh, being anxious about being disrupted out of their their way of life and i remember speaking to uh, a politician who said look you people who care about climate change you've got it all wrong um we don't want to cause higher prices for people uh who are filling up their 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 cars and so on And, and that's 
obviously on one hand a valid point, but even more so a point that misses the fact that things are going to get more expensive if we have catastrophic climate change happening. And, uh, you know, if you deny that, then uh, obviously you don't have to think about that. But um, if we're not in the world of denial, then we have to... You have to live with the actual reality and the reality is that, you know, the cost of inaction is greater. Exactly. That's a very, you know, easy thing to say, I suppose, as somebody who might not be disrupted and uh, ousted from a particular industry in the short term. But on the other hand, we can't just think about uh, the short term, obviously, because on balance, um, it's uh, generations after our own, but also uh, generations already alive uh, today who are, who are coming, uh, who are going to have to pay those other costs. Are there legislative avenues for us to ease those transitions to help people, you know, move into other industries and transfer skills? Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't have to be legislative. Any sort of government policy that on one hand uh, tries to to move us into a uh, lower carbon emission state, but uh, on the other hand, actually tries to help those who are displaced. So, I mean, those are, that would be the ideal. And in fact, in terms of selling to a democratic community, the costs involved in climate change mitigation, I mean, that would be the best strategy. It's the kind of the best moral strategy, but it's also the best political strategy yeah. that, um, you know, we've got to help those who in the short term are going to be displaced and, and uh, affected. And that could simply mean, you know, retraining in, a, in an industry where you're uh, as well off or better. It's not that simple. It's expensive, but it's um, it is actually uh, something that we probably owe to those who are affected by the the changes. That yeah. Um, so what would it mean like when we're talking about actually amending a constitution? Just to move forward there, what would it mean to include fixed environmental commitments in that? Okay, well, now around the world, there have been many uses of constitutions to try to implement uh, environmental objectives. So, for example, you've got countries that have changed their constitutions to say that um, the health of the environment should be protected or that everyone has a right to a healthy environment. It's great and it expresses something that these days kind of bread and butter. It's the sort of thing that very few people can disagree with. The problem is that it's a principle, and there are many other principles also in these constitutions. So a majority of constitutions around the world have, on one hand, environmental pr protection of some kind or a right, but then they all, all have you know, the potential for stepping away from that principle, considering short-term economic uh, issues and uh, the objections of industries that might be disrupted and so on. So just because you have something, even in constitutional law, it doesn't mean that you're actually making progress towards, let's say, carbon emission reduction. So putting something in a constitution is kind of a nice idea, but constitutional scholars like myself, you know, have seen many times that um, constitutional change doesn't necessarily lead to social or economic uh, or environmental change. So in my recent work, I've been looking at the possibility of fixed constitutional commitments. So commitments to an environmental future that's specified and very clear. So it could be, for example, a carbon emissions reduction of, let's say, X percent by, by Y year, and then putting that into the constitution, making sure that it's well enforced. So that would be different from what we've seen in most constitutional provisions in the past. So as I, as I said before, you, you're balancing environmental principles against other principles in the past. Here, you've done the balancing already. You've decided that Greenhouse gases need to be at a certain level by a certain time, and that's what you're actually mandating. Now, that should sound familiar because there's something rather similar in, in international law, and that's uh, the Paris Agreement, which also tries to essentially entrench you know, carbon reduction targets. Um, it leaves each country open to defining its own targets, and it's an international law, so it's, it's not necessarily binding uh, domestically in a lot of countries, but... What I'm proposing then is an analog to that, but in the constitutional setting of a country. So yeah, our basic constitutional principles set out what's most important to us. And uh, one of those principles can be, you know, climate change mitigation strategies that are really precise and hard to get around. Are there potential difficulties with that if we put something really precise in and find out later that that information was wrong? Well, 
uh, one thing we're not going to be wrong about is the need for climate change mitigation. We know that. So what you would want to do is have a ratcheting up mechanism. So you can say something like, let's say we start with 60% reduction of carbon emissions by you know, a certain year. And we actually have a political process for raising that to 65% or 80% or what have you. And that's very similar to the Paris Agreement, um, which again is an international tool. But um, constitutionally, there's no reason why we couldn't do that as well. Um, have a floor rather than a ceiling. Right. So, yeah, we, we, we certainly wouldn't want to lock things up at a sort of modest level when we need to be um, ratcheting it up. Okay. And so, like, if we did make that change, that would mean that there would be automatically, I suppose, a lot of, like, regulations that companies and businesses would have to follow? Would that? Well, you would have to have implementation. The implementation would be very difficult. Um, there's no, no question that just because you have put something into constitution doesn't mean it, it, it'll follow into uh, you know, policy automatically. So what you need, you know, even with a, a fixed commitment, that's very hard to, to budge. You still need somebody to oversee this to make sure that's actually being done. Um, and you need, you need the government to actually be uh, formulating policies to make it happen. Now, it's, it's extraordinarily difficult. Right. Um, but, um, but the strategy is essentially to say, look, we're setting the standard and the ball is going to be in the court of governments to actually meet that standard. And if they fail to meet that standard, then there can be judicial or some other kind of enforcement. Uh, for example, there can be a climate commission, kind of commission that actually looks at what's being done. What is the budget of the, the jurisdiction? not just the economic budget, but the carbon budget of the jurisdiction. Yeah. And um, is the government actually meeting its commitments? Now, there, there could be all sorts of penalties, you could say, both political and legal, if, uh, if a government sort of falls short of this. Now, remember, this is all imposed on the, the government by the people. So constitutional change can be a democratically achieved imperative, something that mandates a particular change that governments then have to follow. So it might sound like you're taking the power out of uh, a democratic government's hands, but this is actually a way uh, in which democratic people can hold governments to a particular standard to make sure that they're so not... It's like holding them. them accountable and making, you know, them giving them more rules that they have to follow, basically. The idea is that um, in Western democracies, there there's a very, very high level of support for climate change mitigation between, let's say, 70 and 80 percent. And in many of those countries... There are further studies that show that people are quite willing to make sacrifices, economic sacrifices, in order to uh, make uh, climate change mitigation happen. So if that's the case, then what we know is that we have the democratic uh, sort of momentum for this. But we, what we don't have is the political momentum always. So we often have climate wars, for example, where uh, governments uh, trade hands and they go back and forth. And each time there's a change of governments. There's a change in direction, and that actually makes it very difficult to deal with these uh, catastrophic uh, problems that are incredibly difficult at the same time. So just because you've got stability and a clear set of standards doesn't mean that you're going to meet those standards, but it makes it a lot easier than if you have no standards at all. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, I do recall like earlier this year or last year, the, there was a, a court case with the federal court who determined that the environmental minister doesn't actually have a duty of care to consider GHG emissions and climate change risks to children. Um, so would that constitutional change be caused to like perhaps change that ruling? Um, look, that's that's a whole other avenue of change. So it wasn't the constitutional case, the Sharma case, but it's still an important case that would have the same effect in some ways as a constitutional provision. So if a court finds that you have uh, in, in tort law uh, a duty of care for, let's say, younger generations, because, you know, when you make a decision on opening new coal mining facilities, you've got to keep those uh, younger generations in mind, then that, that's actually something that can constrain the freedoms of government. Now, the the lower court actually decided that maybe this is something, you know, maybe there is a duty of care, but um, but they were reluctant to actually do anything about it. But then the, the higher court actually said, well, they basically pushed back. And so it, that didn't really go anywhere. But it's part of a movement of litigation in the courts, uh, not just in Australia, but around the world where judges and lawyers are noticing the sort of foot dragging of 
uh, other branches of government and saying, well, look, there's there's a legal standard that we can apply here, and why not use it to force governments to do things, to rise to the challenge? And now, in the absence of something like what I'm calling for, a sort of democratically enacted constitutional standard, without that, then maybe the judicial approach is uh, appropriate. Right. But what I'm saying we ought to have is a democratically enacted you know, set of standards, because then we don't really doubt the legitimacy of those standards. Whereas if we do it through the courts, then that's going to be unstable because we always are going to wonder whether, you know, a future court case will go back on that and whether they should go back on it. Because... Like we feel with like the Supreme Court recently in America. Exactly. Yeah. So you just, you, in, in, the, in the United States, it's called um, backlash. You know, a court might issue a ruling on something like abortion or uh, marriage rights or, or what have you. And then once that ruling has been handed down, we then, we see a sort of uh, backlash among those who don't like that ruling and then over time, actually, there might be a, a reversal where the, the courts actually push in the opposite direction. So that's always something that shows that the judicial avenue is always going to be a little bit unstable. Now, that doesn't mean that um, the constitutional reform avenue is going to be perfect. But I think that it's going to be, if it's ever employed, more stable and, as I said, more legitimate democratically. Right. Okay. Now, I know that in Australia, we do need a referendum to pass a change to the constitution. How much of a barrier does that present? It does present a barrier. So at the federal level, we do need a referendum. Not not only that, but we need uh, four out of the six states to vote yes, plus a majority of voters across the entire country. That, that is a barrier, absolutely. And it's quite possibly something that uh, that would prevent any constitutional change from actually happening. What I would suggest is more important is a, some sort of climate change constitutional reform. And uh, and so on one hand, we can look at the referendum as, as a barrier. But on the other hand, you know, if you hold a referendum, sometimes the, the support is overwhelming. So for example, in 1967, with the uh, alterations to the constitution that uh, essentially sort of uh, welcomed indigenous people into the into certain aspects of uh, the constitution, the sense of an accomplishment was quite quite significant. The referendum, if anything, just sort of raised the momentum right. of, of constitutional reform in that year. So it's possible that we would see something like that if, if it sort of the dam the dam bursts and uh, and if we we get to vote on this sort of thing. There could be a very strong support for it. Well, we have definitely seen like, you know, the um, gay marriage vote was a a plebiscite, not a referendum, but a similar, you know, not 80%, but it was, you know, this is what Australians think. And I think that a lot of people appreciated just being able to vote on a simple issue in some ways, just like a a yes or no um, answer. Do you think that like, the wording or the um, education around the change is really important? Absolutely. So I'm actually working on the Voice to Parliament right now on, on uh, public outreach and, uh, you know, how the wording should be uh, formulated, and but also how it should be presented to people. So you need a fair, very easily accessible set of materials uh, where, you know, some of the arguments against and the arguments in favour are are laid out, whether it's Indigenous voice to Parliament or, you know, constitutional reform for the environment, you would need to be honest about what the, the concerns are and what the positives are, and then make sure that you're publicizing that, but also need to involve people in the the actual writing of this information material. So that's something that um, I'm working on at the moment um, for the Indigenous voice to Parliament. We're, we'd like to convene ordinary citizens from around Australia to um, to talk about um, what are the issues around the voice to parliament, not to sort of decide how it should look, but to decide, you know, how to talk about it to um, the wider population. This is something that is, yeah. it's been done, uh, especially in uh, Oregon, for example, in the United States, where they have um, citizen initiated referendums. This is it's quite a, a common strategy to have these sort of citizens assemblies brought together to write the information that is then presented to everybody else. Okay. Um, So that's a a useful method, (laughs) one among several, yeah. Yeah, I think that um, some of the questions around, like, the the voice to parliament is being, like, uncertainty of what it would look like, like, what it actually means, because they're like, 
yes, Indigenous people should have like, you know, better re- representation, but there's like a lot of, um, I think I, I've seen it, you know, described as they should have a, a say on, you know, anything that could impact them, um, which, you know, is obviously a very broad definition that, you know, opens itself up to a lot. So it's that like, can you give, um, I suppose, some insight into what it would actually meaningfully look like? Yeah. I mean, the first thing, just to back up for a second, um, you know, the, this this issue of whether there's been enough information on the, the First Nations voice presented, well, we're not quite done yet. So we have to wait until there is more information before it can be sort of given to the public. So, you know, it's, it's still to be decided. But then the other thing to keep in mind is that when you change the constitution, you've got to have something really broad, like, um, you know, there shall be an Indigenous voice to Parliament with, the, you know, and then maybe a, a few... Uh, particular points about what its powers would be. Yep. You can't have reams and reams of information in a constitution. That's not how constitutions work. So the way the constitution of Australia works is that you have parliament able to decide on the details. So for example, parliament itself is created by the constitution. And how parliament is actually run is a matter for parliament to decide. So so it's it's perfectly normal for constitutions to have some detail, but not all the detail. In fact, it would be really difficult and negative if you had every single detail laid out in the constitution. So that's just to say that I I kind of, you know, I disagree with some of the rhetoric um, that suggests that there hasn't been enough detail. Right, because it, it hasn't been like, you know, properly worked out yet. So it's... It hasn't been worked out, but it also, you know, it can't be worked out in advance. You've got yeah, to, yeah. You're, you're like, to breathe yeah, and change. Like, right. Okay. And I think that that's also um, an issue that I've seen come up with, uh, you know, recently had a a change in monarch and, you know, some people are going, all right, well, let's ditch the monarchy. It's a similar kind of thing, like where you go, okay, but what would that look like? Do we completely switch our system to like something like the American Republic or is it just like a a change in the role that the, the monarch has in our government? Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, in 1999, the referendum, um, you know, started off with really high support. It was, I think, about 70 percent. And, you know, the, the, the vote basically split among people who want a direct election or, you know, parliamentary selection of the head of state. And the, the problem is that, um, you know, the more the proponents are arguing over the details, the less likely it's ever to, to happen. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's what happened. And there are ways of de- designing a referendum so that you don't have that problem. Like you can have a two-step referendum, yes or no, do you want to be a republic? And then if the majority votes yes, then you decide on a plurality basis, you know, what that should look like. So for example, if you've got four different options and one of them gets 30% and the rest of them get less than that, then you you go with the one that has 30%. Or you can have a preferential uh, ballot, just like we do uh, in, in our elections. So the, you know, the 1999 experience with the republic is actually very instructive in many ways for uh, the voice to parliament and, you know, in terms of whether there should be so much information up front that um, people will inevitably d- divide amongst themselves, even if they're in favor of the voice, voice to parliament. Um, so that's one issue. So, you know, we learn a lot from our mistakes, I hope. Yeah, I think keeping it like really simple to understand is, is probably like really helpful there for people. Um, because I do know that like, I think it was like eight out of 44 referendums being like approved. So it's like a really low percentage. Is that, is that actually meaningful when trying to gauge the, you know, like is past performance, I suppose, a measure of of future success? Yes. Yes. And no, I mean, it's, it's even worse than eight out of 44, you you know, the, the process we have for changing the constitution, it's in section 128 of the constitution. And it says that first you have to get through parliament. Um, and then you go through the, the right. referendum process. Now, there have actually been two or 300 attempts to go through the first step <laughs> and only eight successes in the end. So there have been 44 referendum questions and eight successes, but even more sort of attempts that have failed. That I have not gone off yeah. ground. But, um, right. but, you know, can we learn from that? Yes. A lot of the ones that failed, you know, had certain features like um, a lack of bipartisanship. Um, they were very technical um, they had to do with the Commonwealth of Australia expanding its powers. You know, there are certain recurring problems. Um, one of them is that um, the conservative side of politics tends to be more successful, actually, in 
proposing uh, changes. And maybe that's because conservatives and sort of more progressive Australians tend to trust that the conservatives aren't doing anything too radical. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's not very good for the current Labour government, unless the Labour government is considered to be not particularly radical. I think that that is the case, though. I, I think that, like, the Greens party is considered the radical party in terms of, you know, progressive politics, and then Labour is more like a, a moderate approach. Um, I kind of wanted to touch on, I saw that you've, like, um, spoken about deliberative peace referendums or written about it, and I... I you know, I'm very aware of the recent sort of referendum in uh, Ukraine. Um, that has, it's obviously it's not been found acceptable as you know a way to move towards peace. Um, do you have like positive examples of times then like that kind of peace referendum has been successful? Um, yeah, there are a number. Of, so uh, peace referendums are actually pretty common. Um, by my count, along with my co-authors, I think we found about seventeen just in the you know, the past uh, 40 to 60 years. So um, essentially what ha- what happens is there has to be a constitutional change for peace to come about. And in order for that to happen, in many places, it's thought that um, you should have a referendum. The other way of looking at it, though, is that um, some politicians might actually be reluctant to make peace unless they have the mandate of the people behind them. Mm-hmm. So a really good example of that is in South Africa. In you know, the early or early 90s or late 80s, um, uh, F.W. de Klerk was the prime minister of South Africa, and um, and he wanted to essentially end apartheid in some way. Um, and he faced a lot of opposition in the media, especially. And uh, among white South Africans at the time, however, there was support for this, majority support. And so he, he knew this. He thought there would be certain amount of support. Um, they ran a referendum where only white South Africans could vote. And there was overwhelming support. <laughs> and what that showed was that the appetite for peace was actually very significant. And when you when you have that behind you, the popular imprimatur of you know peacemaking being a good thing, something that we should pursue, then the naysayers, the ones who think that it'll never happen or who don't want it to happen actually can be can be pushed aside a little bit more easily. Um, and it's never easy, but it's a little bit easier that way when you have the popular mandate. So, uh, you know, popular mandate referendums for, for peace that um, Charles de Gaulle did that as well in seeking peace with Algeria. And it was the popular mandate that was overwhelmingly, you know, voted in favor of that helped him to do that. Also in Northern Ireland, you know, that was a referendum that came after the peace agreement, but nevertheless, once the people endorsed it, it was the kind of thing that perhaps helped to keep the the peace from backsliding. So it's been so almost like twenty five years. Legitimacy to it, like you know, this has mass approval, and we can show you, you know, here's the evidence, kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Now, on the other hand, it can backfire. So in Colombia, about five years ago, there was a, a peace agreement with the FARC rebels and the. The peace agreement was 270 pages or so, and this goes to what we were just talking about before. If you put that level of complexity to the voters, they they don't have time to read 270 read pages. Yeah. <laughs> they won't understand it anyway because they're not experts in, in constitutions or peacemaking. And so they vote no because they don't know. And that's, that's the sort of catch cry of referendums. If you don't know, vote no. So this is why we have to make sure that the, like you were saying before, that the the question is simple. It shouldn't be overladen with too much information. And it's got to bring the voters uh, on side by having um, adequate ways of informing them and making sure that it's done in an accessible way. Same thing happened in Chile just a couple of months ago. They had this massive constitutional reform that had, you know, uh, dozens of moving parts. And it's absolutely no surprise that that the voters voted no. Okay. So you've got to, I suppose, do the research to make sure that you've, you know, actually got the support before you run the the referendum, would you say? I mean, that's step one. You you know, um, you would never want to move ahead, for example, in Australia, unless you knew that 70% or so of people actually wanted something. Or, you know, it could be short of that, but as, lo- as long as the level of support is really strong, that, that would be good. 
So I was a part of um, a study that, that looked at polling in Australia on Indigenous um, issues that shows that um, we are at that level, that really strong level. But not only that, but it's been growing um, for decades and it's been strengthening this, this support for Indigenous constitutional recognition. So I think that bodes really well. Uh, you never know if the voice to parliament referendum is going to succeed, though, because you never know what sort of rhetoric will come up in the middle of the referendum. Is that like a challenge as well, where, you know, if you are opening something up to a vote like that, it's like that was um, the big argument against having the the plebiscite for gay marriage was that it opened up all of this, um, you know, hate talk against a portion of the population. So is that something that, you know, is a significant risk? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, I'm I'm not uh, Indigenous, so I can't necessarily make this um, call. Uh, but I think that a lot of people who support the voice to Parliament think, like, the status quo is not good enough, and it's it's harmful, it's painful to many people. And so you have to go through this process in order for there to be constitutional change that's positive to get to change the status quo. Um, and a lot of people uh, on the sort of uh, among the Indigenous uh, leaders who are presenting the voice to parliament as a as an important option probably have made that that balancing consideration that on balance this is going to be potentially painful but um but something really useful that's that's yeah. how i read their um, i suppose their it's it's about you know where the push is coming from as well like if it was just I suppose, you know, like only white Australians were like saying, yeah, let's do this, then you'd pre- probably go maybe, hang on, like are we actually serving the need of the, yeah, of the people? Yeah, that's exactly right. In some ways the same-sex marriage plebiscite and the voice to parliament have certain, you know, similarities. We're, we're dealing with a minority population where everybody else is going to be voting on their rights. Um, and, um you know, that's, that's scary, that's dangerous. Um, but the difference is certainly that um, the plebiscite was, was born of sort of politics in a way uh, and not among the LGBTQ community, uh, whereas yeah. this is different. Um, but, uh, you know, it could be very challenging. It could be very uh, painful. So this is why we need um, those processes that I talked about before, the sort of um, deliberative councils and, and you know, assemblies where if we can have that, then we might actually displace some of that more strident, polarized discussion with something that's more informed and reasonable. And hopefully, you know, people who are going to engage in disinformation will have less luck with it. And people who are misinformed uh, will be less likely to be misinformed. There's this easy source of uh, information. What about the, um, I suppose, the the values side of thing? Because, you know, I'm just thinking about um, issues like, for example, slavery, which was won, you know, through a war rather than, you know, the the people themselves going, you know, what, yes, we'd like to end slavery kind of thing. Like, you know, are are there certain issues where accepting the, the majority vote of, or particularly of, of a specific, you know, portion of the population, like where that's just not an a, acceptable method of deciding a morality or a, a right. Yes, <laughs> for sure. I mean, this is this is something I've been. Uh, this is one of my next projects. You know, when it comes to human rights, um, you can't just give it to the majority to decide. But you also can't give it to just, you know, the elites to decide. You've got to have some sort of combination of the two. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, take COVID-19. <laughs> so we're ranging very broadly here. Um, you know, it, it, during the, the pandemic, there are all sorts of laws, uh, government actions, and people's rights came into conflict. And, uh, you know, on one hand, you needed expertise. You need to, you need to know how... Um, lockdowns would help and or or wouldn't help you know in certain ways uh, you needed to know what the strengths and weaknesses of vaccines were and so on so that's the elite kind of technical side of things but as we were talking about before with climate change you, there's always the value side of things and so you also have to to hear the majority not just the majority but also the minorities uh, and to hear what they think about being put in lockdowns for example 
yeah. you know, because you might make, you might get it wrong. You can't make it a purely technocratic decision. There's recently been a review of the COVID-19 response and um, the sort of independent review. They, they found that, you know, there are certain marginalized communities that were um, overly locked down, for example. Yeah. So you can get things wrong if you don't listen to people. Um, but you've got to have a combination of both. You can't just listen to the majority and the minority and not, you know, care about the technical stuff. You've got to have both somehow. So how, the question is how to do that. And, um, and there are a number of possibilities, I think. Yeah, I suppose that, like, if you have some core values that you're starting from, like equality and fairness, and that's something like, you know, that most people would see as a positive, then you can sort of build upwards from there rather than going a, a specific thing. I mean, that's, um, there's a very venerable line of uh, reasoning exactly along those, those lines that we can find common ground relatively reasonably. But um, when it comes to the, the sort of specifics, you know, it's a little bit harder for us to find common ground. So we, so we can find common ground on values because, you know, we all agree in, in freedom, uh, for example, we all agree in um, the value of, of life and uh, and health and so on. But uh, when it comes to the, the sort of specific policies, that's where things get complicated. But but at least we can have those that common ground at the value level. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important place to to start to to find to actually you know bridge the gap, especially when it comes to like political divide and, and stuff like that. And that's exactly um, what we've argued in in this book, uh, deliberative peace referendums, where. You know, the ones that were really successful, the, the peace referendums that were successful were the ones that um, essentially uh, looked at a, a small number of values that everybody can reasonably agree to rather than 270 pages of technical uh, issues, right? So, um, so for example, in, in Northern Ireland, there was a list of about seven or eight uh, values, you know, uh, mutual recognition, uh, nonviolence, things like that. Ultimately, unless you're very unreasonable, you're going to agree to all of those values. And, um, and it's a great place to start. And that's exactly what happened in Northern Ireland. And, and so our suggestion is that when you have a referendum, focus on the values. And that's one of the ways of making the referendum more deliberative. Oh, just uh, one final question before we end it today. What is something that's happened recently in the world that has made you really positive about the future? Let me think about that. So, I mean, <laughs> I think there are, there, are pl- there are plenty of things. So I, I don't mean to say that, that it's hard to think of anything uh, along those lines. Um, look, I, I mentioned before that there's always been a sort of back and forth in terms of climate change uh, mitigation uh, when you have a change of government. But um, at the moment, the, you know, the biggest Anglophonic democracies, um, the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. The other ones, the, these English-speaking democracies, the ones that I know I know best because I'm an English speaker, yeah, all sense. of them are at the moment are actually uh, strengthening their, their climate change responses. Now, you know, we're, we've been talking about earlier a little bit uh, the possibility that that's not, not going to last. So that's why I think that there should be constitutional protections um, for these policies that are really positive. But... Um, but, you know, for the moment, at least, things are going in the right direction. It's That's, not enough. Yeah. It, 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 is, it is good to see us actually stepping forward into the into the right direction, hopefully. Mm. It, certainly the last election gave me some hope for the future, so it's yeah. um, <laughs> good to Great. see. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure having a conversation with you. It was my pleasure, too. Great, uh, great talking with you.